Shalom, everybody. God bless you and thank you so very much for joining us. I'm Pastor Scott Vlain with Holy Impact Ministries, and today we're going to be taking a look at how it is that we can see the kingdom of God. Can you see the kingdom of God? What does the book, uh, the book of Luke teach us about having the ability to be able to to see the kingdom of God. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at a lot more than just that uh, this evening uh, as we move into our uh, another study into the book of Luke, chapter 9. But uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things that we see here, uh, metaphoric things and matter-of-fact things, uh, things that uh, are spoken directly, things that are spoken to us indirectly. Uh, we're going to test all of this line by line, line by line, precept by precept, precept by precept this evening. And so we're very glad that you're with us. Welcome to everybody out there at YouTube. Welcome to everybody out there at Facebook, everybody at the Holy Impact Ministries website, uh, everybody out there at Odyssey, wherever it is that you might be watching this from, Rumble. Uh, God bless you guys out there, and thank you so very, very much for sharing your time with me here this evening as we go through this most important study into Luke chapter 9 that talks about a myriad of different things. And we're going to be talking about uh, just, just all kinds of things here this evening. But the first thing I want to do uh, out there is I want to uh, ask for prayers for uh, Brother Ron. We have Brother Ron, who, who is always with us uh, in Wooster, Ohio, for our assembly there. Uh, he has been having a just a tremendous, uh, a terribly uh, a difficult time with kidney stones and gallstones and these types of things. Uh, he's been through one operation, may have to go through another operation. I mean, these things are just really, I hear about a lot of people getting kidney stones or gallstones or what have you. Uh, and this is something that's becoming very commonplace that a lot of people have. And uh, he has really been having a time of it. So we want to pray for Brother Ron, if you would, please, uh, that uh, this leaves him and, and this thing passes through him and, and just leaves him alone. Good man of God, uh, good uh, uh, brother out there, and uh, he needs our prayer. So please pray for our beloved Brother Ron. Also, for Brother John, also, uh, who just got done having a new pair of lungs on his way back to healing. We want to keep him in prayer as well. Brother Tim, also who has had this uh, digestive problem, uh, still has that. Keep him in prayer, if you will. He is the airline pilot uh, that we talk about uh, an awful lot on here because of this digestive problem that he has. And we, we pray that you would be with him uh, uh, concerning that matter. Also, uh, Sister Pamela uh, wrote in, and she also wanted to remind me to pray for the ranchers and the farmers in Texas. Uh, we have... Ranchers and farmers that have been ranchers and farmers for almost a hundred years, some of them, and they have been displaced by these fires that have happened. The, the greatest fire in the history of Texas, in the panhandle of Texas, where the uh, the production, the growing of, uh, and, the, and the production of cattle and our beef in this nation uh, is the most predominant in all of the country. And so ranches like the the triple uh, or the quadruple six 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 uh, ranch that uh, they were even making a a movie or a, a uh, some kind of uh, series on uh, again seems to all be up in smoke. All of these people have nowhere to go. Their land has been decimated by these fires in Texas. Please, my friends, keep these ranchers and these farmers and these people uh, in the panhandle of Texas in prayer. Uh, this is a horrendous thing that has happened. And uh, I don't uh, suppose that this will be the end of that. Uh, I think we'll see a lot more of that, especially this year in 2024. But once again, my friends, please keep our brothers and sisters uh, and those people who are in need down there uh, in prayer and, and give where you can. Uh, with that being said, everybody, we're going to take a short break and we're going to jump right into it because we've got a lot of ground to cover here uh, this evening. If you like scripture, you're going to love this particular study. Now, we have a plethora, a boatload of scripture that we are going to be going through here this evening, and we want to invite you to stay with us. We'll be right back in just a moment. You were once a prisoner. held captive by fear, by prejudice, by sin, anger, addiction. But here's the thing, that prison no longer exists. 
Those walls have been torn down. What once held you captive now lays in ruins. You have been set free, redeemed, renewed, and God continues creating by bringing your soul to life. Where there was a prison, there is now a playground. Where there was despair, we find a wellspring of joy. Where there was death, we are given life. Christ has set us free. So live in that freedom. Lift your voice. Clap your hands. Find your joy. And set it free. For you, are a prisoner no longer. Welcome back, everybody, once again, and thank you once again for joining me here this evening. Before we get started uh, with the continuation of our study into the book of Luke this week, I'd like to begin by asking a simple question here this evening. And that question is, can you see the kingdom of God? What does it mean to be able to see the kingdom of God? Do you know that there are professing Christians today in our time that simply cannot see the kingdom of God? I tell you the truth, my friends. Unless you have the eyes to see the kingdom of God, you will never be able to enter into the kingdom of God. And if that seems to be rather perplexing to you, then good, because it's meant to be perplexing. The point that I'm attempting to drive home this evening is that all of us should have the eyes to see the kingdom of God. And I'm not talking about seeing the kingdom of God with our human eyeballs. I'm talking about seeing the kingdom of God that has been promised to us. Can you see it? Do you know that it's coming? Do you know what it looks like? Have we not read the books of the prophets, and have we not read the book of Revelation? Let's take the time to go read about the coming kingdom of God and what that coming kingdom looks like, shall we? We can find that in Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 27. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at that. We'll start with that this evening. Wonderful scripture. The New Jerusalem, Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 27, says this. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and he spoke to me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride and the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were found the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with its rod twelve thousand stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, and the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx and the sixth carnelian, the seventh crystallite, 
and the eighth Beryl, and the ninth Topaz, and the tenth Christophrase, and the eleventh Jacknith, and the twelfth Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and the gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And let's continue on a little bit farther uh, on in the next chapter, in Revelation chapter 22, uh, very quickly here. We're just going to keep on going for the next few verses here. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, it continues and it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding each fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Once again, it's important that we are able to acknowledge the rather uh, uh, metaphoric speech that is presented to us here in the book of Revelation. Water, what is water? The water in the Bible is always people. Light is always truth. What are these things that are, that are being made manifest to us? Do you have the spiritual eyes to see? The words that we read within the confines of our God-breathed scripture are not always straightforward and to the point, as we might assume. One of the first things that were, that were made known to us is that the names of the twelve tribes of Israel will be written upon the twelve gates of the New Jerusalem. And by the same token, we can also see that the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb will also be written upon the twelve foundations of the New Jerusalem, all of which, I might add, were Jews, by the way, which is another study that we could get into but will not due to time constraints here this evening. But, once again, it's important to understand that just as our Messiah himself has already told us, salvation comes from the Jews. I'd like for us to listen closely to the conversation that our Messiah had with the Samaritan woman that he met at the well in the book of John. And for those of you who have not heard this or do not understand this, please stay with me here because this is in, uh, tectonically important. Again, this is the conversation that our Messiah had with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. John chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Yeshua said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Now, I want to stop right here for just a moment, because from the information that we've gathered so far, we have information that should cause anyone who is anti-Semitic, a hater of the Jews today, to stop 
and to slow down and to rethink who it is that they're making themselves enemies of. According to our god breathed scripture, the names of the twelve tribes of Israel will be important enough to God to have them written on the gates of the new Jerusalem. But the very foundation of Jerusalem, get that, my friends, understand this, the foundation that supports the new Jerusalem will have the names of the twelve Jewish apostles of the Lamb of God written upon them. Furthermore, our very own Messiah and King, who was, is, and always will be a Jewish man, says that salvation comes from the Jews, which once again fulfills the prophecy of Jacob, whose name was changed by God to Israel, written about in the book of Genesis. Let's go check that scripture out as well. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 and 11. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. Again, a lot of metaphoric speaking here. A lot of spiritual talk, my friends. This is, you know, instead of using that big word, metaphoric, uh, we should just use uh, in plain English. It's spiritual talk. It's all written all throughout the Bible, my friends. And if we don't catch this, and if we don't understand what that means, the blood of the grapes, what is that he washed his vesture in? Well, we know that our Messiah is going to come to tread the winepress of the wrath of God in the book of Revelation, do we not? Again, all of these things, when we start speak, when we start thinking in a spiritual sense, start making good sense. Once again, as we have said so many times before, so now we say again, if the Jesus of the church today is not a Jewish man, then the Jesus of the church today is indeed, as the Apostle Paul puts it, another Jesus. Which is another Bible truth that we don't have time to reteach here this evening, but does once again become tectonically important to know when it comes to having the ability to see the kingdom of God. You see, the foundation of God's family is the Jews. The Jews are the root. Just as the Apostle Paul tells all previous Gentiles in Romans chapter 11. Once again, if the ruler's staff is not between the very Jewish feet of our Messiah, who is the root that supports us all, then the Jesus of the church is indeed, as uh, the Apostle Paul puts it, another Jesus. Is that important to know? Yes, it is important to know because Paul tells us that he who preaches another Jesus is to be accursed. To be accursed. And I'd like to read this to you from Romans chapter 11 because a lot of people do not understand Romans chapter 11. Now, I have taken the liberty to insert some parentheses here that will do not add to the Word of God, uh, per se. They just help us to understand what is already here in the Word of God. And I want you to test that here. Romans chapter 11, verse 17. Let me read this to you. Paul says, But if some of the branches were broken off... Now, what's Paul talking about? What branches were broken off? He's talking about the olive tree. He's talking about the Jews, the unbelieving Jews. Okay? But if some of the branches, the Jews, were broken off, and you, a Gentile, he's talking to the Gentiles, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others and now share in the new nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches who were the Jews. If you are, if you are, again, arrogant towards the branches, if you are, remember that it is not you, the Gentile, who support the root, but the root that is the Jews, that supports you. Then you will say, well, the branches were broken off so that I as a Gentile might be grafted in. And that's true, Paul says. 
They, the Jews, were broken off because of their unbelief. But you, the Gentile, stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, you Gentile, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jews, neither will he spare you, Gentile. Okay, so do we understand what Paul is telling us here? Uh, again, Paul speaking very spiritually about this olive tree and the branches who make up the Jews. That's who the Jews are. The root and the branches are the Jews. Okay, what does Yeshua say? I am the descendant and the root of David. David, a Jew. Right? But getting back to the point at hand. Can you now see the kingdom of God? Do you see it? And if the answer is no, then you need to stop looking for the kingdom of God with your fleshly eyeballs, and you need to start looking for the kingdom of God with the spirit that God gave you. Again, Romans chapter 8. So very, very vitally important. And I want to go back to that because it is so vitally important, my friends. When you read through Romans chapter 11, and if you are not familiar with Romans chapter 11, I want you to read the whole thing. We're not going to read the whole thing here this evening. But I want you to read the whole thing. And I want you to understand who this uh, olive tree is and who the branches are. Now, we could go through a long uh, study on this. But all you really need to understand is that the Jews are the branches. Some of them were broken off because of their unbelief. But it tells us at the end of the book, uh, Romans chapter 11, that uh, Yahuwah God will once again make sure that all of Israel will be saved and that they are enemies for our sake, Paul tells us, for the time being. But they are loved for the sake of their forefathers, says the Bible. So if you are anti-Semitic, if you are against the Jews, if you think that everything that the Jews do is a bad thing... Uh, you need to wake up and start looking at things with your spiritual eyes and not so much with your fleshly eyes and what the mainstream weaponized news media is telling you. Again, my friends, these are important things for us to know and to hold on to. We are not to be like the rest of the world. And therefore, what you are you know, what are you using to see or to find the kingdom of God? Are you using your flesh to find the kingdom of God? Or are you using the spirit that God gave you to find the kingdom of God? For I tell you the truth, you will never be able to see the kingdom of God with your fleshly eyes, for it is the flesh that leads to death. The kingdom of God can only be seen by the Spirit and through the Spirit, not through human fleshly eyes that desire everything worldly. Is that important to understand? And therefore I ask you once again, can you see the kingdom of God? And if so, are you working towards leading others to it so that they also can see it. Because that's what we're doing here this evening, is teaching people to see the kingdom of God. This is vitally important for us to understand. Keeping all of that in mind, let's now open the book of Luke, and let's read Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 27. And let's see within these scriptures if you can catch the importance of being able to see the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's go back here. Let's, let's, now that we've set the stage, let's go ahead and let's read. Now, I want to read uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 18 through 27. So let's jump over there very quickly. And we're just going to read these first few paragraphs here, 18 through 27. Now it happened... That as he was praying, or he, and now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And they asked him, 
who do the crowds say that I am? So Yeshua is asking them, who, who does everybody say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Once again, we find our Messiah and King asking the disciples who were with him who they thought that he was. And some of them said, well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and even others say one of the prophets of old. But it was Peter who stepped up and said, and I quote, You are the Christ of God. You are the Christ of God, says Peter. Surprisingly enough, no one else seems to be able to see that. Once again, Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 9. I want us to take a look at this. It says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, says Paul. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it can't. Therefore, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And so what's Paul saying here? Paul's saying here, look, you know, if you're counting on the flesh, if you're leaning on the flesh, if all you believe in is what you can see with your eyeballs, then you are hostile to God. If your mind is set on your sinful flesh that is sinful and is going to rot back into the dust of the earth, then you are hostile to God because the flesh does not submit to God's law. It can't. The flesh cannot submit to God's law. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If you are living for the flesh, if you are, if you are taking care of all of the desires of the flesh, if you are worried about the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, what you wear, what you eat, what feels good, you cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And why cannot they? Why can't they please God? Because the flesh does not submit to God's law. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Can you see the kingdom of God? Some say yes. Others say no. Who do you say that I am? Some say Elijah. Some say a prophet. Once again, it's important to point out that the word Christ in our English language translated uh, from the Greek word Christos uh, means something a little different to the church today. 
And I want us to know and I want us to understand this because this is tectonically uh, important for us to understand. Excuse me, just a minute. This is this is very, very important for us to uh, to grasp here, because if we don't grasp this, uh, we are going to completely miss what Peter just got done calling Yeshua. Once again, Christ in our English, English uh, language is translated from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed or Messiah. And another way of defining anointed would be chosen. If you are anointed by God, this means that you have been chosen by God. Christos also means Messiah, and the word Messiah or Mashiach in the Hebrew language means to be a Masonic prince or a king of Israel. I'd like us to consider Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Let's go take a look at that, because I think you'll find this very, very uh, interesting. So I want to go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 6. Again, this is Christos. I just wanted to make sure that we understand that. Christ, Christos, means anointed. It is uh, Strong's G5547. It means anointed, that is, the Messiah, an epithet of uh, Jesus Christ, or uh, Yeshua. Hamashiach, right? A Messiah, Mashiach. Do you understand that? That's what that means. Okay? So this is very, very important. Now, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So uh, that's Jacob's trouble. That's a, that's a lot of trouble that's, that's coming. Uh, and uh, this is, the, again, the, talking about the destruction of the sanctuary and the temple that took place uh, shortly after our Messiah had passed away. And so, but I want us to pay attention to this word Messiah here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now, here we can see that the king of Israel will be cut off, which once again pertains to Yeshua of Bethlehem. And yes, I said Yeshua of Bethlehem and not Nazareth. We must remember that our Messiah and king was not born in Nazareth, as the church loves to teach. Messiah, Yeshua, our king, was born in Bethlehem. Okay, so once again, these are things that important things we need to keep uh, track of. Now, this word Messiah that we find in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel comes from uh, Mashiach. Mashiach. Now, if you are a Mashiach, this means the Messiah, the Messianic Prince, the King of Israel, the High Priest of Israel. There's only one Mashiach. There's only one king of Israel. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is this word Christ in our English translated New Testaments comes from this Hebrew word Messiah or Mashiach, which points once again to Yeshua's identity as a Jewish man who came from the body of David and the tribe of Judah, just as God promised that he would come from in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And this Messiah, this anointed one of God, is also our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, which is another biblical fact that we don't have time to get into here this evening, but I would highly urge you and suggest that if you don't already know that Yeshua is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, please go read Psalms chapter 110 of the Old Testament and Hebrews chapter 7 of the New Testament so that you can keep up. <laughs> okay? And it's vitally important that you know these things if you're going to keep up with these, this study and with all of these studies. All of these things need to be known so that we can keep up. That's Psalms chapter 110 and Hebrews chapter 7. That's your homework. Okay? Is that important? That's very, 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 very important. Okay, so getting back to Luke chapter 9, now that we know who the Christ is and what that word means, it's also tectonically important to know who it was that our Messiah said that he would be killed by in Luke chapter 9, verse 22. Okay, 
So uh, again, these are important things to to uh, understand. Luke chapter nine verse twenty two, saying the Son of Man. This is your red letter words from our Messiah. He's prophesying about his death and who's going to kill him. He said the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by who? By the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed on the third day. Be raised. Once again, it was not an atheist, or the Samaritan, or the local ball worshiper that wanted our Messiah and King dead. None of them were conspiring against him. It was the pastors and the priests of his time, the so-called men of God that, consp that had conspired against him and bore false witness against him in order to have him murdered. And as we have said so many times before, so now we say again, this is a spiritual war that we are in. There is no difference between the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees of Yeshua's time and the so-called men of God in our time, who this very day teach and preach lawlessness and have willfully and intentionally chosen to make void the word of God in order to hold on to their own man-made traditions. Which, once again, is another whole study that we don't have time for here this evening, even though it is well worth pointing out. The Roman Catholic created first day of the week Sunday Sabbath, commanded by nowhere, anywhere within the confines of our God-breathed scripture. And we could also mention the Roman Catholic created Good Friday, that's not mentioned or taught anywhere within the confines of our God-breed scripture, or a Roman Catholic created Pagan Easter Sunday morning, that's not found anywhere within the confines of our God-breed scripture. Nowhere. Look up Good Friday. See if you can find that. Look up Easter Sunday morning. See if you can find that within your scripture. What did Daniel say? Daniel chapter 7. What did he say? He said, The beast would think to change the times and the law of God. Has he done that? Has he done that? Do we keep the times and the law of God today? And don't even get me started on the lie of a Roman Catholic created Christ Mass on December 25th and the blasphemous traditions of the Church that go along with that heresy. But I digress, as they say, for a moment. Lots to know here, my friends. A lot to know and be aware of. Which brings us very nicely down to Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27, which is where we find uh, the commandment of our Messiah and King to pick up our own crosses and to follow Him. Once again, my friends, if we choose to save our own fleshly lives, we will indeed lose the promise of eternal, everlasting life. If we deny our Messiah and King before men, and what is right in his eyes before men? He will deny us as well before his Father. We must always remember that it is written that we are not to fear what man can do to the body, but what God can do to both body and soul by casting them into the pit. We, if, if, we have indeed willfully and intentionally picked up our crosses. We'll indeed put our hands to the plow and not look back. Which goes along very nicely with what our Messiah and King tells us in verse 27 when he told his disciples that some who were standing with them that very day would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God. Did you catch that? We oftentimes get a lot of questions from a lot of misguided Christians about that, and especially those who want to claim that the Bible is of no effect and is full of error. 
Again, my friends, this is something that we need to understand. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 27, he says, But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Would there be those who could see the kingdom of God? Did, was Peter able to see the kingdom of God? How was it that no one knew who the Messiah was but Peter? Peter saw who he was. Why couldn't they see who he was? You see, we must have the ability to see the kingdom of God before we taste death, or we will not be reaching for the kingdom of God. Once again, consider the original Greek word translated as see. Okay, When we take a look here, it says, Behold, I tell you truly that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. What's that word see in the original Greek language? Do we know? Well, let's go take a look at that because it's important that we do that and we understand that. Whenever there's a question in your mind about the Bible, you need to go back and, and look closely. Look closely. See is the word idu. Once again, the English word see here in Luke chapter 9, verse 27, has been translated from the Greek word idu. And idu does not just mean see with your human eyeballs. The Greek word idu can be used either literally or figuratively. By implication, adu can mean uh, so see the kingdom of God by implication, or to know the kingdom of God, or to be aware of the kingdom of God, or to consider the kingdom of God, or to perceive or to understand the kingdom of God. And therefore, once again, was Yeshua telling his disciples that they would see the kingdom of God with their eyeballs, with their fleshly eyeballs, or that some of them would have the ability to see the kingdom of God through the spiritual eyes of knowing and perceiving and understanding the kingdom of God. Consider our Messiah's conversation with Doubting Thomas found in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 27 through 29. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, because Thomas wouldn't believe that he was Messiah unless he could, he could actually physically see with his human eyeballs, right? So he's having this conversation. He's just come off the cross. He's reappeared to them. He's sitting next to them. And then he says to Thomas, he says, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand out and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Yeshua said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I tell you the truth. Doubting Thomas should have been able to see what Peter saw in knowing that Yeshua was the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One of God. But old Doubting Thomas was weak in his faith, and therefore Yeshua had to show his fleshly eyeballs, and just as Yeshua told old Doubting Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. You see, believing is seeing things that our human eyes cannot see. And it is this belief that fuels our good works, which James tells us only true faith has. James chapter 2, verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. My friends, how many Christians out there who are self-professing Christians do you know that have dead faith because they have no works? How many Christians out there today 
who run around claiming that they believe and claiming to have faith but have no works realize that what they actually have is dead faith. Those who claim that works are dead are actually living with dead faith because they do not have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. Can you see the kingdom of God? I hope and I pray that you can. I most certainly can. And this is exactly why I run the race each and every day. My hope and my prayer is that you run that same race. And the winner of this race will not be to the swift, but to those who have endurance and are able to conquer over evil. My friends, I hope and I pray that that makes a lot of sense to you. I hope and I pray that you are starting to, as we get into this New Testament, understand the deeper spiritual speech that is given to us here within this scripture and able to understand it. Uh, if everything that we read, we read uh, uh, just point by point, matter-of-factly, and we're not looking at the spiritual implications of what this means, we are never going to understand. Again, this is why our Messiah spoke in parables. It's why he hides himself, and he only reveals himself to those who seek him. If we are not asking, if we are not seeking, if we are not knocking, we'll miss it. We'll miss it. Take the time to ask to seek, and to knock. And with that, we'll close the books for this evening, and we'll pick up next week in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, with the transfiguration when Peter, John, and James get to see our Messiah transfigured and speaking with both Moses and Elijah, which, once again, gave Peter and John and James a pretty distinct vision of the kingdom, don't you think? <laughs> More so, I think, than everybody else got. That's coming up next Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until that time, my friends, once again, as I always do, I will ask everyone within the sound of my voice to please take what you have heard here this evening to your own prayer closet. And you bow your head and bend your knee and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you've heard here this evening be true or not. Ask. Seek and knock on his door and on his door alone so that the proper door can be opened unto you. And my friends, if you will do that, and if you will stay the course to the end, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon coming kingdom together. My friends, there's much to know, much to understand, and much to put together. Uh, everything that he gives us is another blessing, and it's just another brick in the wall that, that continues to build the foundation that is the truth of God's Word that we build our houses upon. And so once again, everybody, God bless you. Thank you for sharing your time with me here this evening. Let's pray. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all names. We thank you, Messiah Yeshua, for these God-breathed scripture. We thank you for the things that you reveal to us secretly. We thank you to the secrets of the kingdom that you have given to those who you have chosen, those who are seeking you, those who really, really, truly want to know, and for the right reasons. Thank you, Messiah Yeshua. We pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach that we would continue to be blessed, that you would continue to reveal yourself, to reveal your kingdom, to reveal what is happening around us, to help us to navigate through these wicked and dark days that we are now living in. We pray that you would help us to have more tenacity, to speak boldly and to stand where it is that we need to stand and to shine the light of truth that we have been given where it is that we need to shine it, and to be the salt of the earth that preserves your word for all the world to see and to hear. 
Thank you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach for being who, all that you are and thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do. Thank you for the blessings that have been stowed upon us that we do not deserve. Help us to always stay humble. Help us to know and to understand what it is that you have done for us and the gravity of the situation that we are now in today, entering into that great tribulation. We thank you for drawing that Paleo-Hebrew left across the nation, and we thank you for the warnings that are to come. We hear them, and we will stand fast as you have commanded us to do, as long as you do not leave us. May we always be just as our Messiah prayed. One, bind us together with unbreakable chains. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we ask these things. Once again, everybody, God bless you. Thank you for joining me this Wednesday. We're going to get into some interesting things coming up. Uh, this next coming Saturday, uh, we are going to take a look at John. But then we're going to start getting into the Passover because the Passover is coming up on the 24th of March. And uh, that is uh, very, very important for us to understand. Uh, if you need to know when the Passover is, you can go to holyimpactministries.com, look at the feast day calendar. It's been there since the beginning of the year. Go take it, check it out, take a look at it. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about why it is March 24th. And we'll be talking about uh, how to keep it and what it means and why it is that the church today is so lost. And why it is that we teach and we preach that the church today has made void the word of God in order to hold on to their own tradition. We'll see what the Bible says. We'll see what they're doing. And then we'll choose what it is that we will do. And that's all coming up within the next few weeks. So this is a little bit of a look ahead of time. Uh, we will see you this next coming seventh day Sabbath, my friends, at 1030 a.m. Thank you so very much. And shalom.